All right, Baldacci. Yes, sir. Baldacci, uh, where'd you grow up? Where are you from originally? I'm from uh, Los Angeles, uh, Florence District, South Los Angeles, basically. That's what it basically is. Mm -hmm. And tell me uh, about your family growing up. You had mom and dad? Yeah. Um, yeah, my mom and dad, um, you know, they're born here as well. Uh, I was born actually at the hospital, Centinella Hospital in the city of Inglewood. And from that hospital, I was took to a street called city, uh, Converse. Uh, that's why I got this Converse All-Star tattoo, because I'm an all-star actually from the block, you know what I mean? Um, growing up, you know, my mom was basically the main person in the home because my father, he was in prison for a long time gone. And, you know, so it was a little bit, you know, harder for me, uh, being the fact that, you know, my father was gone. I'm not going to blame that totally on, you know, him being gone, me being what I am today or everything that I live is because of that. Um, but it's definitely hard without a father figure in the home. Yeah. What um, was dad in prison for? Um, he was, my dad was in prison for a bunch of robberies, you know, growing up. That's, I guess. Was, was he in a gang? Yeah. My dad was also from Florence, uh, as well. Uh, my brothers, my sisters, basically all of us, except for my mom. My mom was the one that stuck to working two jobs to try to, you know, feed us and keep us, you know, in a straight line. But at the end of the day, it's like, you know, you, you. You go for what you want to do. It's mm -hmm. not, you know. How far did you go in school? Um, I actually got a GED, but I did uh, get my GED through the prison system. Um, on the streets, I went to maybe like seventh, seventh grade, maybe eighth grade. And then it was basically I went to juvenile hall from there. Like I was a kid, gone. Like, you know what I mean? I was living the street life. So, so the, the gang stuff started for you early? Uh, 13 years old. You know, I was being intrigued by the lifestyle and kind of uh, amazed by it and just basically went, you know, went at it, went towards it instead of actually trying to live a different life. Like that was what was in my in my future, I guess. You did know the, did I mean? the idea of being uh, anything else in, in life um, come into I, your head? Like, I, honestly, at a young age, I didn't really think about no career. I really didn't think about what I wanted in the future. I really didn't think about my future, to be honest with you. I, it was just day for day that I was living. Um, that's that's what happened, basically. I ended up, you and know. You're, you're down in Florence, which. Yeah, Florence. Florencia is one of the most notorious gangs. Yeah, that's where that's where I'm from. You know, um, basically, like I said, at a young age, that's that's what caught my attention. And that's what I ended up, you know, becoming a part of. How and it didn't take long for you to go to prison? Um, no, I mean, it's it took as long as me to turn the legal age to go. You know what I mean? Like I, at the end of the day, like I started going to juvenile halls real young at the age of 13, 14, going in and out, you know, my first time going, I actually so ju got- Juvenile hall sounds nice, but it's actually just jail for kids, right? Right, that's a jail for kids. You know, once I seen that it wasn't actually as bad as the way people make it seem, you know, like growing up, they're like, oh, this and this and this happens, which it probably does to certain individuals that allow that to happen. Uh, myself, you know, I went in with somebody else as well with me and we kind of like, you know, he he put me up on game on our way to juvenile hall. Hey, you know what, this is what you gotta do. Don't be scared, you know, just do your thing. And I did, and I kind of, like I said, I, I learned that it wasn't as bad as the way people explained it if you don't allow that to take place. Is you know jail I mean? and, and later in life prison kind of like a rite of passage for, for you guys? Uh, what do you mean? Is it, is it just like a badge of honor? Um, I mean, at the end of the day, it's like, you know, everybody like growing up in this lifestyle myself, I don't want to speak for everybody, but myself, I kind of looked up to like, I wanted to go just to experience, you know, what everybody else says. You That's know, they say, yeah. you know, you get home, you get a lot of love, you get a lot of respect, you get, you know, it's just, it's something that I kind of like spoke into existence or just actually just walked into, walked into it being part of, you know, my lifestyle. Who, who were your role models as a kid? My dad, my dad was my role model. But he was, you know? he was in prison. Yeah, he was in prison, but he was still my role model. You know, my dad, uh, you know, as far as I can remember, my dad would send letters, but my dad would encourage me to stay away from life to stay away from the gangs and you know don't get myself caught up and for me to listen to my mom like he didn't sit there and try to make me be part of the gang or join the, the that lifestyle but 
at the end of the day, it's like you can't tell somebody to do something when you did it yourself or you're in that position. Like, so I could remember my dad sending drawings home from prison, sending us cups, you know, with artwork on the cups, Tupperware, like, and all that, you know, was, was fascinating to me. All that was really like intriguing. And so I, I, you know, and I didn't even have to go look for it. Like it just basically came to me. What was your, what was your first gang activity as a, as a young kid? What'd you get into? Um, so like at the beginning, you know, me growing up 13 years old, I ended up getting caught for three stolen vehicles and one day it's funny because, you know, um, I got caught basically, it was like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I got caught early in the morning for, you know, joyriding, being in a stolen car. At that age, they know that you're a kid and you're, you know, bound to be getting in trouble. So they released me to like the custody of my mom. You know, she had to pick me up or whatnot on the scene, actually. Like they didn't even take me to the station, nothing. It was basically, get your son, get out of here. Lunchtime, again, I was arrested for another stolen vehicle. Um, and again, they basically kicked me out to my mom and took, you know, here, get your son, keep him off the streets, punish him, do whatever you gotta do, but we don't wanna see him out here again. Uh, my mom took me home and, you know, at the end, it was nighttime, you know, somebody called me up, hey bro, like, you know, can you go with me to go pick up my aunt, ooh, and this and that. I'm like, yeah, I got you, whatever. So I jump in the car with him, thinking everything's cool. It ended up being another stolen car and I ended up going to jail. This time the cops pull up, mom gets there. They told her, look, just go home. He's going to jail. So this time I ended up going to juvenile hall. I didn't stay there that long, but it was my entrance to seeing what the juvenile system was like. Mm -hmm. How much time have you spent in um, behind bars? That time or just like- Oh, just know, in, in your whole general? life? I've, I've pretty much been incarcerated more than half of my life. So it's just been, in and out, juvenile halls, camps, every, every, everything. I just touched basically a lot of different places. What's more treacherous for you, uh, the streets or, or prison? Um, I think like the streets and, and prison are basically the same, except for the streets, you have more space. You know, the um, prison system, it's a lot more closed. So it's like you, you can't get around the way you get around out here on the streets. You know what I mean? It's just a different, it's a different atmosphere, but still basically the same. Like everything, anywhere you go, the streets is dangerous. Prison is dangerous. Like, you know, being the fact like prison, it, it can go from you having a year left on your time and you can end up doing the rest of your life in there. If something just ends up happening, you know? What, what kind of craziness have you gotten into in the streets? You've been, you've been um, shot at, you've been shot? Yeah, I actually got shot when I was 18 years old. Uh, I had barely turned 18 years old. I was shot five times with an AK-47. Uh, I was in a coma for two months. Um, man, I have like a missing spleen, a uh, missing kidney. Uh, I had like a half a pancreas, half a liver. Both my lungs collapsed. My aorta was torn. Um, one of the nurses came in when I first got shot and wanted to take off like the two, like not the tubes, but uh, the like attachments that I had basically on me. And she said, oh, we're gonna walk you. I wanna walk you. And I was like, I couldn't talk cause I had a tube in my mouth, a tube in my throat, like on my side. And I'm like trying to explain to her, like I can't walk yet. You know, I'm not ready to walk. She didn't listen to me, but I, like I said, I couldn't talk. So basically it was like one of these, like, no, trying to explain to her. She didn't listen, she followed up, kept taking off everything, sat me up, and when she sat me up, an uh, air bubble rushed to my head, and I passed out. I basically died in front of them. Uh, the doctor came in, brought me back, said that I was purple or blue or whatever. Uh, once he brought me back, you know, they asked me to move like a certain part, side of my body. Honestly, I kind of get confused, or like, it's hard for me to remember what side, but it was like one of my sides, I was paralyzed from either my right side or my left side. But what he did was say like, oh, move your right hand. So I moved it, move your right leg, I moved it. Then he went to like, hey, move your left arm and your left leg, and I couldn't, like it wouldn't budge. So what they had to do was basically uh, take me to the Long Beach Memorial Hospital. They put me in a diver's tank where I was at an angle. Um, I remember them putting a, like a, they had like a rolled TV that rolled over the, the tank 
where they put on a movie, like I think it was something about Mary or something like that. They put the movie on. Within five minutes, I was out. I was gone, sleeping. So I guess they, I don't know if they gassed the, the thing or they, what it is that they do, but they put you to sleep. Uh, they brought me out. Again, he told me to move, move your right hand, move your right leg. And I, I was able to and move the other side and I couldn't. So they put me back in. The second time they brought me out, I was able to move my right and my left, both sides. So basically they popped that air bubble that went to my brain um, due to the fact that I don't know if it was because of how fast she sat me up or whatever it was, I was not ready to do what she wanted me to do, which was walk, you know? And um, yeah, thank God I, I was able to, you know, overcome that and I'm able to move both my hands, both my legs now. And, you know, I'm still, I'm still here. Yeah. Did you, do you ever consider the fact that, you know, the doctors and nurses worked so hard to save you mm -hmm. and they were successful only to have you go back on the streets and probably reoffend, right? You know, at I the moment, it's, it's so crazy because at the moment, you know, I had my people coming in to visit me at the hospital. Uh, one of my friends, you know, he had a low rider, a nice, really nice car that I would always tell him, oh, let's go cruising. But he would always be like, oh, you know, I'm busy or this and that. He came to see me and he's like, hey, bro, when you get out, we're going to go cruising in my car. And I told him no, because my mind was like, I can't, you know, I have to get home and survive now, you know, but it didn't go as planned. I got out. And I actually, I feel like I kind of got worse after that because I felt like, okay, the banana clip didn't drop me. You know, what can, what can stop me now? Like, let's go. And it just, man, it turned into a world of, of trouble after that. You know what I mean? Not necessarily after that, but just it continued. I kept on with my lifestyle. I didn't just say, hey, I'm, you know, throwing in the towel, I'm giving up, or, nah, it's like, I feel like it kind of made me, made me an angry person, you know? It escalates, doesn't it? For sure, like, it just, I, after that, you know, I went to prison right after that. I wasn't even home for, like, long enough to do basically anything. I was in a wheelchair for a little bit. One of my friend's uh, wives actually came to my house put a sheet around me because the doctor said I was going to be paralyzed. You're not going to be able to walk. Um, that was a lie because I'm walking, you know. My, my boy's uh, wife came through. I, after the wheelchair, we went from she, her picking me up, tying a sheet around me, kind of taking baby steps to that. Went to like two days and then went into a walker. I walked on the walker for a couple of days. Then I was up and running, you know. And I ended up uh, getting caught for a pistol. Uh, sending sent to prison. Um, yeah, that was my that was the beginning basically of my prison term. Was me uh, getting caught with a gun. I ended up taking a, sev a six year joint suspension, which basically means those six years stay over your head. Uh, if you catch another case, that's my attorney explained to me. If I caught another felony case, I'll go do the six years plus whatever that felony carried. That's not how it happened. I ended up getting a tattoo on my throat, which is this F-13 here, and they gave me six years for the tattoo. So I didn't even have to catch a felony to go do those six years, which I was, you, you know. Got, you got time for a tattoo? I got six years. Originally, the time is for the gun, you know, and that's how they look at it. Like, you're not doing time for that. You're doing time for the gun that we basically gave you that joint suspension for. So. My tattoo, I was on uh, gang supervision probation. I guess that was a violation. You know, they came to my house. They found sweaters that had my gang on it, pictures of myself and, you know, other people, my homies, and they ended up. Yeah, if you, if you have Florencia and F-13 all over your body, you're, you're right. asking for trouble with the cops. Yeah, and at the end of the day, it's like, I mean, I'm filled up with tattoos. Like, it didn't stop me because I went and did that time. And while I was doing that time, I got more tattoos. You know, I filled up basically my body, you know what I mean? But being a kid, I, you know, I went in young and I feel like it was basically the right time for me to go anyways. You know, at the end of the day, I, like I, I, I learned, I, I sat there and, and worked out, got myself in shape. Uh, yeah, basically like it was, it was a blessing and a curse at the same time, I feel, you know? What, what, what is behind all the violence and all the typical gang behavior? Is it just the testosterone in young men? That yeah, I, I feel like, you know, people are caged up. You know what I mean? They're, they're, they're miss their families. They miss their girlfriends. They're, they're, um, some people have 
25 years. Some people have 18 years. No, but even on the street. Oh, on the street. Even, like, even on the street, you know, um, where does this come from, all this gang? It's, it's, it's hard to say. I feel like, you know, this is stuff that's been happening way before us. So once you join, you basically earn that hate towards the next person that's been going at it with your homies or they're going at it with these people. And like, especially if somebody hurts one of my people, like one of my boys that I grew up with, you, you earn, you basically, it just. Is it just human nature? We're, we're meant to be in packs? Um, I feel, I kind of feel that way at the end of the day. I feel like, you know, even watching National Geographic, you see the way the lions move. They move with their, with their squad of, who they, you know, I, I recently watched, I can't, I really can't remember the name, but it's, it's about these lions that uh, they basically, they're brothers or what, whatnot, and they move together and fight, fight, fight to the end. For territory, know? for power. Right, just everything, you know what I mean? Like food, survival, you know? So at the end of the day, I feel like that, it, it might ha have to be like that for everybody. Yeah, sometimes I think it's just human nature to right. Just comes you know, with whether you're a country or a street gang. Doesn't matter. Yeah, like it just it just comes with it. But what was your favorite childhood memory? Um, my favorite childhood memory would probably be with my grandfather. He passed away. He was a good man. <clears throat> um, him and my grandma were married for I don't know 40, 50 years or whatnot. Uh, he was a really, really, really good person. He would. If we would see a bike that we wanted on the street, like somebody, a kid with it, we didn't have it to where I could say, hey, go buy me that bike. But what my grandfather would do would drive off in his truck because he was real hands-on building. He can make you whatever you basically wanted. He could fix any car. Uh, he was just a, a beast with his hands. Um, he would drive, get in his truck, drive around, find a bike, frame that's just sitting in the alley or sitting on the street he would take that go home sand it go to the bike shop buy wheels whatever pieces to the bike that he needed he would make sure he gets them when i would get home from school if i told him this morning oh look i like that bike he wouldn't say nothing oh yeah it's nice me boom we get to the school go to school when i get home that bike would be sitting there you know like Maybe not the same exact bike, but it looked damn near similar, really close. And he was the one to make that happen. Like that always will remain with me and all the stuff that he basically embedded in our heads, which was positive, more positive than anything else because he was, like I said, he was a really good man. My grandfather, rest in peace. Do you have kids? Yes, I have three kids. And you, were you around to raise them? Um, so like the only one I got to actually seen born was my middle son, his name is Music Don. I was home, I was with the girl at the time, like in relationship wise when he was born. So I was in the hospital, I got to cut the cord, like everything that took place with, with him being born. I named him, I named him Music Don. So um, he, he's basically like my only son that I was able to see being born. My firstborn, um, I hit the system when his mom was pregnant, like a week, week pregnant, you know, like, so I had to actually see him being born basically while I was in the system. Um, my last kid is my daughter. Um, she's still a baby. She's, uh, you know, four years old, going on five years old or whatnot. She, uh, I didn't get to see her born because we were dealing with a whole bunch of, you know, relationship problems and it, it got, it got kind of bad with the whole separation or whatnot, but, um, yeah, you know, I, I try whatever I can to be in, in, you know, my children's life. One of them was taken away from me, basically, from mother, like, just basically left and haven't heard anything from them. But they're my kids. I love my kids to death, you know, and I feel like, you know, it took my son, my oldest son, a little while to realize whatever's going on with their mothers and myself is not doesn't have anything to do with them, you know? And my son, once he was able to say, hey, I want to meet my dad, like I, not meet him, but basically I want to see my dad. I want to be around my dad. Then the mother basically was put in a position to where there's nothing she could say, but say, hey, here, you know? So 
you know, I have a relationship with them. Um, a few, of, like two of my kids, I haven't really been, you know, seeing them as much as I would want to or as much as I should be. But, you know, I feel like I said, with my oldest son, he kind of realized I need to see my dad, you know? So I kind of let, let them sort out their selves, you know, instead of me trying to put pressure or, hey, this, or blame each other or, uh, it's, it, I'm over that, you know? Mm -hmm. What's, what's been the hardest thing you've had to deal with in your life? Um, my health. Um, I, I want to say my health, dealing with my health is, is just definitely been a bumpy, you know, road. From the gunshots? From the gunshots that, you know, later on just, you know, it, it's been a long time since I got shot. But at the end of the day, I still have complications and, you know, deal with certain stuff that I'm have, that I'm, I have to go to the hospital for certain things at certain times. So I, I want to say that's probably been the hardest for me. I'm, I'm sure you've inflicted some of the same kind of pain on other people. You know, I mean, growing up as a kid, it's like so much stuff happens, you know, and at the end of the day, it's like I'm not proud of anything. Like I'm not, you know, people, people fight for their, for their, you know, for their people, yeah. for their, you know, streets or, you know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's been, like I said, a bumpy road, both sides, you know what I mean? At the end of the day, like, I'm here still. I'm alive. You know, that's that's the that's the blessing, the good part of it. You know, live by the sword and die by the sword. It's it's crazy, man. Did you, you know? believe in karma? Oh yeah, I, I believe I believe in karma. I believe you know. I just feel like it it can it doesn't have to be the same thing. If you do something to somebody, that doesn't have to the karma doesn't have to hit you back the same way. It could be in a different form. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? You could be put in jail for something you didn't do. And that's your karma for something you well, did. I, do. I think you carry around the subconscious guilt. Right. And you're yeah. just waiting for, <laughs> you're going to do something to bring it. Yeah, at the end of the day, it's like, you know what I mean? Stuff happens for a reason, I feel, you know? Hmm. You, ever, you ever wonder what your life would have been like if you'd grown up in like Connecticut or Kansas or something like that? I actually you grew up in, the, you know, in one of the most dangerous parts of LA, right? Yeah, I grew up in South LA. So, you know, like it's, it's kind of hard to picture growing up somewhere else only because that's all I really knew. That's all I really know, you know. Have, um, you, have you ever left LA? Um, to be in prison, basically. That's that's the only time I really left and, and lived anywhere else, pretty much, no. Like, that's where I've been since I was a kid, like. Um, There's a whole world out there. Right, you know what I mean? It's like, I feel like. I just wonder if you, like as a kid, if you had traveled to Europe or, or right. Asia or something. I've never really traveled until basically now that I'm a little bit older that, you know, like I do, I do music and whatnot. So now I'm able to, to get out a little bit and enjoy other parts of what's here. You know, like I, I never had the opportunity before cause I was young and like I said, involved in everything that was going on in my area. So at the end of the day, it's like, I didn't have time for anything else other than that, you know? Are, are there, I'm going to go back to the karma conversation we just had. Are, are there are there things that you've done that you take with you as you put your head on a pillow at night? Um, that you. Uh, I mean, I feel like everything that's been done in my life. You know, I I like I said, I started really young and I got myself in a lot of trouble. I feel like I pay, I've paid for a lot of the things that I've done, and it's like now that I'm on a better track and trying to focus in on, on myself and a better me, I feel like I've done basically my time for that. I've suffered from being shot and living that lifestyle. And now it's like, it's a, I, I don't wanna say a fresh start because that's always gonna stay with you. Like the way you look, the way you grew up, it's always gonna stay, you know I mean? That's not going away, but if you ask me, I'm a better person today. I'm able to wake up and, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say I, I just go wherever I want because, like I said, again, look at the way I look. Streets, they don't care if you feel like you're changing or doing the better, better deed in life. Stuff still happens. So I still watch myself. I still carry myself with the mentality that I grew up with is to keep myself in, in line and, you know, safe. Yeah, I mean, you must know when you're getting all these face tattoos of. I brought that upon myself. You brought it on yourself. You know? you, yeah, and you, you you knew that was coming. No, for sure. And I feel like you know I started young with the tattoos on my face, 
as a kid, I was, you know, 13, I was 14, I believe, when I put my first tattoo on my chin, I had an F-13. Um, they just kept on, and I felt like it wasn't Could even- you explain what F-13? F is, F-13 is Florence, you know, that's- And 13 Florencia, is- that's what I was, yeah, it's, that's the gang total, like F-13, Florencia 13, you know? So what- Thir 13 is what? It's, 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 it's our number, you know, our number. Like, but 13 F signifies uh, uh, Me Mexico, right? South. Like us, the South. You oh, know? the South. Okay. Right. So, we um, basically, you know, I feel like the tattoos kept going. Like I wanted more. I wanted more, and I, I wanted to stand out from everyone else. I didn't want to look like the next guy. I wanted myself to be different. And you know, little by little, it was like, oh, I need one here. This one don't look right. It looks empty here. This needs to match this side. And bro, look how I look now. You know, it's like I. I went through a whole bunch of pain getting these tattoos and a lot of them were in prison. So, you know, a lot of people are like, damn, when I step into certain places, they're like, how much have you spent on tattoos money wise? And I'm like, a couple cases of soups, a couple, you know, bags of beans, some rice, you know, like, like it, in prison, it's like we look out for each other. You do my whole back tattoo, bro, and I got you. I'll send you a package. That's exactly how I got my whole tattoo done. One of the homies that did tattoos, he didn't have much. He was like, hey, you know, you bless me and I'll bless you. Like he got, he had really good work. So I had him do my whole back. I sent him a package. I reached out to my family. Hey, can you send this person a package? You know, it had roast beef cans, deodorants, soaps, whatever it was that he needed. He gave me a list of the stuff he needed and I, I got it for him. In prison. In prison, Yeah. you know, because we were able to get packages at that time. What would you say is the most important thing you've learned in your life? Um, How old are you? Um, I'm 40 now. I just turned 40 a couple days ago. Right. I, I would say the most important thing in life is what, 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 what you've learned in life. Um, trust. It's like trust is I'm really big on trust. You know, it has to be basically earned. Um, it's hard to trust anyone now. You know, your closest people, your any anybody can basically turn on you. You know, females that you deal with. I've dealt with females that, you know, now it seems like they're my enemies. And for, at one time in life, me and you were tight. You were my best friend. I, I did this for you, you did that for me. Since it didn't work out, now we're enemies. And it's like, it shouldn't be like that. You know, at the end of the day, it's like, okay, things didn't work, on, work out. There's a lot more people in this world that you can go try to find someone. To a lot, a lot is made of how men are violent and dangerous and all that but i think women can be just as scandalous and treacherous oh yeah especially nowadays before i feel like the women were a little bit different a lot of the like you know my sister my mom they're different from the women that are out today and i could see that you know what i mean like i noticed that why because i've been with women back then and i've been with women now and i see the difference and the change in them which i understand that they've probably been through a lot dealing with men dealing with abusive people like you know that's one thing i've never done and i'll never do is put my hands on a female i learned that from my dad you know my dad his exact words would be if if you hit a bitch what does that make you excuse my language but that's that was his words to me and it made a lot of sense to me it stayed with me you know i'm like you hit somebody that's this like not low but females they don't have the strength we have they don't have you know, the, the testosterone that a man has is different. You know, God made them different from us for a reason. They're feminine. And I feel like, you know, you put your hands on a woman, then you lower yourself under that. You're feminine, you know. But to each his own, people do it. Hey, if that's how you were, you know, raised or brought up or you feel like you need to let out your, your anger, I mean, I'm not here to, to stop anybody from doing anything anyways, but... If it comes down to that myself, I don't agree on that, you know, like, and I won't ever do it. Yeah. Has the gang presence or the gang life uh, deteriorated since you were younger? Um, I mean, I want to say like over the years, things change different, different uh, times. You, you, you were of, around during the drive-by era. Yeah, I've been around. I, I've been around since my, when I, when I joined, I was uh, 13. I, that was like, um, 
maybe like 95, 96. So all that was basically kind of toning down already, but it was around, like, you know what I mean? Stuff like that did happen, you know what I mean? And it was, it was rough. It was rough growing up in that, in that time. The and 90s were really- How has it, how has it changed now? Um, I, I want to say just the, the, the generation of people, um, the, the solidness, the um, trust, again, is, is completely different. You the, know, a the, lot the of- The integrity. Yes, I would say that too. I just feel like, you know, um, I'm not saying that all the generation now is tore up or messed up or there's still solid people that, you know what I mean? But it's just like a, a lot of what goes on now is not what probably would have been going on back then. And it's just, I mean, I can't even pinpoint and say this, 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 that. It's just, there's so much difference, you know? Have you mellowed with age? Um, like calm down basically. Yeah, yeah I, I'd, I'd say a lot like, um, you know, with my music career now, like I kind of want to do that. Like, and you know, the, the good thing about it is that my people, my friends, my homies that I grew up with respect it and appreciate it and push me to do that. Instead of, you know, people looking down on you, hey, like you, you're not trying to be out here doing this and that. Like people are more for it and willing to help me get further by, oh, hey, you know what? Look, we got these cars you can use for your music video. We got, you know, these girls that you, you know, maybe put this girl in your video, like that type of stuff. It's like encouraging and motivating. And I'm really, you know, blessed to have that, that, you know, that and people embrace that, you know, like it's, it's hard to actually be that way. A does, lot of- Does it feel, good to, get, to be creating something that maybe helps someone in some way with mu- your, your music? Yes, I, than I, what you used to do? You know, like it's-, it's or, I mean, I, I, assume, I assume you're still active, but you're just- right. Well, like I, I kind of look at it like it's not even about the activeness because my face and my the way I look is gonna have me in that box forever, for the rest of my life, you know? I'm not out there running around acting a fool, getting in trouble no more, if that's what's, what we're asking, uh, but I'm still me, I'm still good with my homies, they love me, I love them, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I feel like with my, with my music that I do now, I give a message. A lot of, I went to, to jail on a violation, my probation officer basically violated me and said that, hey, you know what? He did an album, he wasn't supposed to be doing an album, he talked about his gang or whatnot. Basically, he made it seem like I was promoting the gang lifestyle. Um, I look at it like I'm telling my story. So at the end of the day, it's not about promoting or glorifying or doing this. I'm speaking my story of everything that I've been through. And it's up to the kids nowadays to take that message and say, hey, this is what I gotta go through if I wanna live like this. Or I don't wanna live like this. I wanna do the right thing and stay away from getting shot five times with an AK. I wanna stay away from going to prison forever, you know, it's like, and it took me years to be able to, to learn this, you know what I mean? At the end of the day, it's like, okay, I lived a rough life. Now it's like, I want to be able to bless other people with that knowledge that I didn't really have growing up to know that there's other outlets, there's ways to, you know what I mean? Maneuver and, and still live and enjoy your life. So. With all these face tattoos, what, what kind of reactions do you get from people when you walk into a, a liquor store or a grocery it, store or something it's, like that? It's, a, it's a, actually a trip. I like this question because so many times I've gotten, I mean, I get both. I get negative and positive faces from different people and the way people look at me. The good thing about it is me seeing their expression once they talk to me, once they see who I am, once they see I'm not what they think. It's a, it's a beautiful feeling because it's like, okay, you thought you were gonna hear this. Or when people reach out to me on social media, they're like, hey, and I respond. They're like, I didn't think you were gonna respond. Or I thought you were gonna be mean. Or I thought, you know, and I'm like, I'm just like you, you know what I mean? I got tattoos, okay, cool. You know, there's just like some people born, you know, a certain way, a certain color, a certain anything, we're all human at the end of the day, and it's like, it's a blessing once they get to, you know, interact with me and communicate with me. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing to see the, 
the change in from five minutes ago. All right. Baldacci, thank you so much for sharing your story. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate you for having me, Mark. I wish you the best of luck, man. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it.